Jasmine Jasmine is here. Don't forget to tap into the Darce podcast. The Darce choke is a submission executed from the front headlock position. It involves encircling the opponent's neck with the crook of one's arm, while the other arm wraps around the opponent's arm applying pressure, leading to a tap or unconsciousness. Ladies and gentlemen, get your guards up. Where are we? We're in the desert. We're off in a faraway land throwing hands. It's the UFC Abu Dhabi, and you're here with me, Brasco, Slick Montana, my guy, Mr. Plus Money, and Cal on the ones and twos for picks, bets, analysis on UFC Abu Dhabi. Interesting card here. Just coming off UFC 304, where we have a new welterweight champion. Hate him or love him, you got to remember the name now. Bilal Muhammad takes the strap from Leon, who had won 13 straight fights, and it was an interesting one. Uh, I know that Mr. Plus had a big win. I saw him smack like a plus 800. I know Slick came up like seven, eight units on the night, so well done, boys. I broke even, had some great winners, had some losers with Manel Cops broken toe, Bobby Green shooting a takedown. I need some reactions. Mr. Plus, with that big winner, who'd you have on that ticket? Watching fights and and not losing any money is just as good as is is watching the fight and winning money. In my opinion, not losing money is better than that. So anyway, great job for all of us breaking evens. Definitely, we all know a win. Um, yeah, I, I'm excited about this this card, Abu Dhabi. What I love the most about last card, uh, I guess it was the RoboCop call. Man, he just worked Leroy Duncan. That wasn't even a close fight. Plus money. He was on that ticket. I had Aspinall, of course, by TKO or sub. We all know how fast that fight was. And the last leg, I switched over to Bilal Muhammad probably a few hours before the fight as I was watching back that presser. And this dude was so locked in. And when you're that locked in and you're you're really fueling those boos into your own energy, uh, yeah, man, I just I, I knew it could be a long night potentially for Leon. So switched over to the plus money and uh, paid dividends. I was really chasing because Molly, Molly McTrash can ruined like seven parlays for me. Dude, the one English, or not, a couple Englishmen went down. Christian Leroy Duncan, like you mentioned, got beat up by RoboCop. Great call on that. And I saw RoboCop uh, gave you a little DM thanking him for the support. So that was really cool. Uh, double win there. And yeah, Molly Meatball must have busted some uh, British parlays there. Bruno Brazil, how did I overlook it, Slick? The Fighting Nerds. Ooh. We went to the Fighting Nerds camp. Cal knows it. I said I wouldn't fade them until they lost. And I missed that. I, maybe he's just low profile kind of over there. Bruno with all the killers. Uh, what were some uh, reactions you had from the UFC 304 card slick? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what type of things they are doing in that fight in Earth. Like, Bruna Brazil was legit a karate type of girl, balancing back and forth, and she came in there with some wrestling grappling boots that I've never seen before. Like, But Luma Lukbumi made her look like a freaking amateur in the grappling, so I just don't know. Like, something's going on in that camp, and whoever that come out of there, I want to bet on them. <laughs> I, so, I think and, they saw something in tape on Molly because they were working the body pretty heavy. And I think they saw that in tape and they're, they're a cerebral group. And I think that's what it was, man, because they worked that body early. They were throwing that knee up the middle on the takedowns and it was just stopping Molly every time, man. Bro, the knees, I wanted to throw up for Molly. It was a rough one, a body kick early. And yeah, she, she went for it at least slick. At least she fought her heart out. But yeah. Yeah. And then honestly, um, I was a good night for me catching a five unit max play that came in from last week. You know, we had the Garcia fight at uh, no distance, and we actually caught the Aspinall fight no distance at minus 600, closed at minus 1,000. But probably the most sweatiest, that should have never been the sweatiest of them all, legs. Two legs hit in under a minute. And then Nathaniel Wood, man, I had him in that parlay as the last leg. And my God, man, this guy made me sweat for no fucking reason, man. This guy could have finished Pineda in the first, could have finished him in the second, could have finished him in the third. And it was just sweat after sweat after sweat. <sighs> Thank God he won that fight. But, man, I'm done betting Nathaniel Wood at big minus money. Bro, I took a half-unit sprinkle on him by finish. He drops him with a teep to the body. He's destroying his calf. He drops him with punches. And he continues to engage in grappling with a dangerous grappler. What are we doing? Low IQ stuff, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, tisk tisk. In any case... Don't look now. Back to back, Dars parlays are cashing on the Lamos Jandy Roba card we cashed. And last week we cashed all the legs hitting. So let's keep it rolling, fellas. And let's jump right into a really nice fight. It's going to be on the Slick Report. And I'm excited for this one. Banger in the women's division here, Slick. 
What do you got for us in Lupi Godinez versus Mackenzie Dern? Yeah, I mean, I already see money coming in on the person I'm about to talk about. So hopefully we get this out as, I mean, not get it out, but hopefully you guys lock in on this early because it looks like it might be minus money by the time you watch this or by the time you place the bet in. So we're going to go right into it. I'm going to go with my girl, Lupi Godinez, in this spot. I honestly think that these odds are just not even nowhere near supposed to be close. Lupi Godinez has shown great wrestling defense. She has shown great uh, wrestling offense. She has go, she has shown great boxing, something that, honestly, the only thing that Mackenzie Dern has here is submission, uh, submission ability, and that's not even – she doesn't even work to get submissions. They're just Hail Mary submissions, Hail Mary arm bars, Hail Mary – stuff that she gets from uh, on top. I, I think Lupi Godinez keeps this fight on the feet and honestly makes it look easy. She's way more technical than, than Mackenzie Dern. She probably has nowhere near the amount of damage that Mackenzie Dern has suffered in her last two fights. Like, Lamos put a fucking beating on her. Jessica Andrade damn near murdered her in her second round. So I, I just don't know. And then those two fights, you would think that she would try to wrestle, and she didn't. She stood toe to toe and didn't shoot for a takedown against Lamos until late in the second round. Like I, I question her fight IQ. I think Lupi Godinez. We've seen what, what this Mexican independence. I mean, uh, Mexican independence. I'm tripping. What what she's been showing in her last couple fights, and she's been showing aggression, man. She's been showing that she's willing to eat one to get one, and she's she she has she's way more technically sound. So I'm gonna go with her. I really like the plus money spot, and Mackenzie Dern for me is just in this spot is a sub or bust, honestly. She doesn't. She's not gonna have nowhere near the type of volume Lupi Godinez is gonna have on the feet. And I just think Mackenzie Dern is only in the UFC because she's quote unquote looks good. So Mackenzie Dern, I mean Lupi Godinez money line, and I'm also gonna sprinkle her probably by submission in the third round. Interesting stuff there. I'm liking the Lupi Godinez side. I think you're a little harsh on Dern. I mean, she's got obviously nasty jujitsu skills. Slick knows this, but I mean to be fair, you take a look at every time she's you know challenged for the upper echelon. And she's gotten beaten bad, you know. Even Amanda Hebos got her way back in the day. Uh, the loss to Marina Rodriguez where she was getting outboxed and couldn't really uh, get her grappling off until the end of the fight, throwing up, like Slick said, a Hail Mary submission off her back. Opportunistic grappling, right? Um, Yan Xiaonan, majority decision loss. I thought that was clear, 29-28. Andra and then coming off damaging fights, right? Lamos and Andraj, like, those are some rough ones. So her wins in between there, Tisha Pennington, close split decision where you might have been able to give that to Pennington, to be honest. And Angela Hill, where she actually had good offensive take. Now she beat her up on the ground. Uh, and I kind of with you, man. But Luby could put it a porous boxing defense for Mackenzie Dern. When she's on the feet, she's a liability. And I think I know what you were referring to. So like for the Mexican independence, I was at UFC Fight Noche on Mexican independence night. And Lupi put a beating on Elise Reed. We were talking about it earlier on uh, social media, on IG Live. And if that version of Lupi comes out with those crispy hands and her offensive wrestling, she could get this done. So I'm with Slick here. Mr. Plus, do you think Lupi Godinez is the right side here? Who Slick thinks yeah, could turn into the favorite soon? I was on uh, I was on the fence for this one, to be honest. But now that you guys are selling me on it, for sure. I went back, looked through Lupi's stats, too. Her only last L was to Verna, who's now looking like she could be the next champ. Uh, she's looking real good. So, you know, yeah, I got to side with Lupi here. Although she's got the height and size disadvantage, I don't think it's going to play that big of a part. Uh, she's really crispy on the feet. And if we could see that side of Lupi, I think that she's going to get the job done. And uh, just, you know, Mackenzie Dern, she doesn't come off. Yeah, her BJJ is good, but she doesn't come off like this offensive wrestler so i just like loopy better uh, i see her being able to stick to takedowns easy uh stuff them easy and uh and, and loopy's gonna win this fight i think you guys are right uh 29 28 if Dern gets lucky in one round holding her back uh, but probably a 30 27 i could see that and cal's gonna chime in I, I agree though like getting plus money to fade a fighter that's submission or bust feels pretty good cal what do you got on it yeah, man, I think that the same for the same reason I was on Jandaroba, a lot of people were looking at uh, the Dern Jandaroba fight as this gauge for things, right? And like Loopy's wrestling, I have to say this respectfully, but no, nah, fuck it. It's trash. Like it's garbage. Like she has. You mean no Dern's wrestling. wrestling? You mean Dern's and wrestling? A big, a, a big part of the reason why she has no wrestling is because she has no hands. She has no setup for her wrestling. She can't like knock on the door to get inside to actually get the wrestling going. Her hands are trash. Her, her, her face is in the air. She has like good jujitsu but i'll be honest with you even in top position she's been swept before she's been actually lose she's lost position many times so for me i just think that dern is just not a good gauge for a lot of things if i knew this was going to play out on the ground sure but gender robot we, we learned and as, as uh mr plus was saying 
Her wrestling is that good, and she gets the positions really well. She did dominate Loopy, and that's why the line is like this. And that is not a good recipe for you if you're on the money line spot um, for, for the chalk. So I think this is a dogger pass. Um, you know, Loopy making all the right decisions. I love that she's Canadian, but she left Canada to go train with Grasso, training in the right camps. Her hands are getting better. She's a fucking problem. I'm sorry. Loopy Godinez plus money. Great slip report. Let's go. The whole squad is on it now. Bring that Mexican boxing. Let's see it get one level sharper, and she should be piecing up Dern. So, yeah, maybe, maybe she's the favorite just because she's the name, right? She's the jiu-jitsu champ, but uh, this is Loopy's time, I think. All right, I love it, Slick. We all do. Now it's time for the Mr. Plus Parlay Bus. Grab your bus pass and jump aboard. We got three fights to talk about, one of which opens up the card. Another middleweight uh, card in the uh, – excuse me, fight in the middle of the card. I got that. Uh, between two ladies going at it. And then an interesting one, banger between uh, some light heavyweights. Yes. Mr. Plus, jump into it. Who do you like to kick off the parlay bus? Let's keep the bus rolling and crash it into the next cash counter, just like we did last week, boys. And that's right. If this parlay bus hits correctly, which I'm hoping it will, we should all be cashing before the main card. Here we go. First leg of the parlay bus. We're going with Cedric Dumas. He's fighting Dennis Tolulin, and Tolulin is just that. The Tolulin can. Rem I'm bringing it back. This fight got canceled. It was supposed to already happen, and I was betting on him then, and I'm betting on him now. Cedric Dumas is going to be better everywhere. He's younger. He's sharper. He doesn't have the best fight IQ, but I think the guy's going to be able to beat a can like the Tolulin can. Remember, it's even weaker than aluminum. It's like glass. Next Stop for the parlay bus. Same card. Next fight. We're going to a girls' fight. Usually don't put these on the bus unless I'm real confident. And this one I am. Victoria Dudakova. And I'm really just fading Sam Hughes here. She is absolutely another one that just takes L's. Nothing good looking out of her. I think she only has one fight. I haven't seen anything good on tape study from her. She just looks atrocious in these L's. Um, and, and really, honestly, I got to go with this 8-0 and o to keep it going. Man, uh, this Russian chick is definitely no joke. And she beat up Jin Frey, uh, the karate girl. I just like her style. Uh, I like that she can control the fight, take it where she wants to go. And she's the next leg of the bus. And to close off this parlay bus, we're jumping up. to. I think this is the scariest leg, but I got some backup from my boys. They're going to tell you why. But I got to go with another undefeated fighter, Azamat. Muzarakanov, if I said that right. <laughs> Brasco will correct me. Don't you worry. Give me a sec here. But I think he's going to win because he's better everywhere with fight IQ, controlling the octagon, knowing when to take it down, and knowing when to keep it on the feet. This dude has crispy fucking hands. Russian dudes usually want to get in there, grapple, and do all that shit. Not this guy. He'll knock you the fuck out on the feet, boys. Uh, I really do like him to get this job done against Alonzo Menafield, who Brasco's going to tell you he's coming back way too soon. Just got floored. Uh, I this it's it's not the right time. You don't come back and fight this undefeated guy that's on the up and up and putting everybody out. So that's the parlay bus this week, boys. Let's fucking roll this shit to the next cash counter. I'll see you when that shit cashes. Banger plus two thirty five. If you're pairing Cedricus Dumas, Victoria Dudakova, and Azamat Mirzakanov all together, three interesting fights, Mister Plus. First of all, I never forgot the Tululin can a new element, a rare element which is much weaker than the Illumina. That's so funny, man. I love that so much. Shout out Dennis Tolulin, who said hi to me in the Boston Logan Airport, but not shout out to his performances. Slick, I know Dumas is not the sexiest favorite to back, but he out-wrestled the wrestler in Corey Brundage, uh, Cody Brundage, and before Nur Sultan Ruzibor jammed his fingers into his eyes and the ref did nothing about it and let the fight get finished, he looked like he was there. He took a shot, ate it, moved forward. I mean, the guy's got toughness. I think he's the side here. What, what do you think about that first one? Man, I love Dumas in this spot, man. This is just a fade. Dennis Tolulin as much. Like, he's starting to get to the Jordan Wrights, the Phil Halls of the UFC. No matter who he fights, he's going to make them look good. And if you're on a losing streak, this is the best person for you to fight. So Cedric Dumas is probably going to have the way better hands. All Dennis Tolulin got is a Hail Mary punch. And like you said, I've seen Dumas eat plenty of good shots. I think his chin is up there. The only thing that you have to worry about, Dumas, is his cardio. But Dennis Tululin has like three minutes of cardio himself. So I wouldn't worry about it. I love this spot for Dumas. And I'll be playing home by finish as soon as the props comes out.
Yeah, I think he finishes the fight. So I think he could get a sub, maybe crack him, you know, club and sub. And Tallulah has not been very good on the ground. Mr. Gentlemen, Club. I actually have a piece of Tallulah that I can show you. <laughs> See this? It's almost like paper, but it's it's the same color with the mirror as uh, aluminum. Anyway, that's Tallulah. <laughs> like a piece of confetti that if that's his fate he's in trouble the second leg mr plus had slick was victoria dudakova she's fighting sam hughes he did not have good things to say about sam hughes i'll say one good thing about her she's tough man she fights hard but dudakova is certainly the more skilled fighter hughes has just gotten beat up and hard nosed losses just not giving up on herself which i always respect but she's usually outmatched by more skilled opponents she did have that win over jacqueline amarim who gassed out and kind of just lost a cardio battle do you think she could like push the pace on Dudakova and put her in trouble, or is she gonna get beat up again? Nah, because the thing about Dudakova is that she has good footwork, and that's gonna be a problem for a girl like that just plots forward like Sam Hughes. So honestly, that Jinyu Fry wasn't that Jinyu Fry wasn't an impressive win, but the she 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 said that she was fighting staph infection all the way and in places you know I don't want to say, but. You know, so that that could have been a problem, man. You know, like so sometimes, you know, you don't want to get messed up down there or something happened down there. So maybe that just because honestly, this is a wrestler grappler type of girl. And she actually kept it on the feet. A lot of people was worried about her stand up against Estella Nunez or I think that's her name. But, you know, that rough, that fight never really played into fruition. Like one, like 15 seconds into the fight, uh, as Nunez broke her arm. I don't recommend watching that fight. But. I think it's definitely due to Kova all day in here. I think, like I said, she's going to have the footwork. She's going to have the wrestling defense for anything that Sam Hughes is going to offer to get the fight down to the ground. And Sam Hughes has no takedown defense, so due to Kova wants to get her wrestling blues going. I think she can. But honestly, if she just wants to do the same thing against Jenny Fry, stick stick to st ah, stick on the outside and just keep popping her with jabs and straight shots, I think she could do it for all three rounds. So I definitely like due to Kova in this spot. Definitely, yeah. And Hughes' forward pressure and her relentlessness makes her super hittable. So whether it's on the ground, it's on the feet, plus – and Slick feeling like it's all due to Kova. And then his last leg, Slick, was Azamat Mirzakhanov. Like he said, alluded to uh, Alonzo Menafield, who at this point, man, I I've cashed on him as a dog before against Dustin Jacoby. I was super impressed with him in that win. Speaking of which, I was super impressed with Azamat Mirzakhanov and his win over Jacoby, where I thought Mirzakhanov was going to have to grapple against the highly technical kickboxer. He out kickboxed the kickboxer. In fact, it was Jacoby that was trying to grab. A few moments later. All right, y'all, we are back. Absolutely trash Spectrum. Put your hands up for Spectrum because they're throwing hands at us, but I'm not going to out. They're giving me a freaking bill credit because they interrupted our work hours, fellas. We were in the middle of talking the Mr. Plus parlay bus. We broke down why we like Cedricus Dumas, broke down why Mr. Plus chose Dudakova, and the last leg was Azamat Mirzakhanov taking on Alonzo Menafield. And this is an interesting fight because Alonzo Menafield 10 weeks ago ran into Carlos Olberg's devastating punch with a, a display of negative fight IQ. And after that, I mean, Mr. Plus, that was 10 weeks ago. Like, you're going to you're gonna not only recover from that, but also train for a new camp against, like you said, a sharp technical striker who also has grappling skills. Like, I don't I, – I backed Menafield before as a dog when he beat Dustin Jacoby. That was really impressive. Mirzakhanov beat Dustin Jacoby too. Interesting similar opponent, but I just don't see it here for him on such short notice. Slick, do you give Menafield any chance at all? This is just a tough spot for Menafield because he's just one of those types of guys that he wins rounds with knockdowns and stuff like that, like he did against Jacoby, you know, like he was winning that fight basically just getting a knockdown close to the end of the round. And I just don't see him hurting Azamat to the point that he knocks him down or gets him out of there. So I just think Azamat just pieces him up on the feet, probably gets a knockout in the earlier rounds or later rounds. And um, and get gets this win uh, easily. Yeah, plus two thirty five on the Mister Plus parlay bus. I think it's definitely worth a tail. I'll be betting it too. Mirzakhanov, Cal, correct me. Mirzakhanov, get your put the emphasis on the correct syllable, as they say. All right, guys, let's move on to the Brasco breakdown. This is my this is my hand signal now. We got, we got the salute for slip. We got pull the horn for Mister Plus. I'm gonna do the like evil plotting against the world. And I'm going with Corey the Sandman Sanhagen. I don't care. Look, guys, he's one of my absolute favorite fighters, and I know what everyone's going to say. You're betting against a Nurmagomedov in Abu Dhabi? Yeah, pretty scary stuff. And Corey, a fantastic fighter, is plus 250 on the money line. I mean, it's wild to see how far apart the odds are. You understand it. The wrestling pedigree of Umar Nurmagomedov 
is that of his namesake. He trains with Khabib. He trains with Islam, all the best in the world. And you see it when it's on display, right? Even if he's getting decision wins, they're pretty dominant. They're pretty safe. It's tough to beat technical guys like that who can chain wrestle. His striking is improving. All that being said, like Cal said, who I know agrees with me, Corey's got some of the best fight IQ in the game. You see him from opponent to opponent game plan and execute. And even if he tears his tricep, he'll hold Rob Font down for three rounds, right? Even if he gets into a nasty fight with Cheeto, he'll beat him up on the ground. He'll use his lateral movement. He'll use his mind, his elbows, his knees, his explosive techniques, and then his boring techniques, whatever he needs to take control of that moment. Now, he's going to have to defend takedowns, that chain wrestling of Umar. And it's going to be tough. He's going to need to use every bit of that fight IQ. And I heard one analyst say he's going to have to pitch a perfect game. I kind of agree with that. It's going to have to be a damn near immaculate performance from Corey circling, circling, landing. But the difference to me, I feel like, is he can land the more uh, uh, um, dangerous damage, I should say. I feel like he has the chance to maybe land an elbow, cut uh, Nurmagomedov open, make him bleed, make him go through adversity, maybe even a knee, right? Corey's lethal knees and elbows. And then what happens, right? Can Umar go through that adversity if Corey, Corey cracks him with a shot? I know Corey will be there. He's been in so many five-round fights. I saw Umar talking on an interview saying he's going to drown him with the pace and the pressure, and Corey's cardio hasn't been able to or won't be able to hold up. Uh, I'm sorry, Umar, you've never been in a five-round fight. So I'm going to go ahead and give the cardio edge to Corey. And in Umar's last performance against Bexat Almakan, an unknown commodity that kind of surprised us and gave him a fairly competitive fight, you know, he's not – just like making anyone run to the counter, I think, to bet him minus 360 after that. So we're getting all those assets on Corey, a guy who's been there against the top five for so long, who's fought against pressure boxers like Song Yadong and been able to put them away, uh, you know, veterans of the sport. And yes, he's had his losses, but to nothing but really great fighters. I'm going to take the shot at plus 250 on Corey, the Sandman, Sanhagen. And I, I know that a lot of people will be against me. So I'm interested to hear what my boys think. There's my spiel. Mr. Plus. It's a plus money ticket on the main event. We're going into enemy territory again. It did not work out for last week's breakdown with Bobby Green. Yikes. I want to win this one. Do you think I'm out on a limb here? No, I don't think you're out on a limb. I, I think this is the real deal here. I think it's the last fight of the night. The dog, the parlay spoiler, perhaps. Um, I love that Corey Sandhagen is the tallest 5'11 guy that I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I also love how lanky and long he is. Uh, and yeah, we saw that Bezmot guy put it on uh, Umar where he knocked him down. Uh, and, and I think Corey's going to do a lot of that. I don't think it has to be Corey's best uh, performance overall. I think it has to be a good stand-up performance by him. And avoid those takedowns and avoid that Habib uh, squeeze uh, that these guys, the, the Nurmagomedovs, know how to do and try to keep you on the ground. Uh, that's all he has to avoid. If he can get back up, and, and again, as the lankier guy, it's hard to keep a bigger guy down. Um, so I, I do like Corey here. I like everything that he's going to be able to do. Uh, five rounds, just like you said. Uh, I think he can outpoint him if he doesn't put him down. Um, and, and realistically, uh, the strength of schedule here is just way different. There's levels in this game. This is going to be Umar's biggest test ever. And I'm just not the, I'm not a big believer in this particular Nurmagomedov kid. I think this is where he's going to get hit. He's not going to be able to enter that top five or top four, top three. Um, I, I really like Corey here. There's a good spot for him. Uh, and I, I can see it by finish, but I'm just going to take that plus money at the end of the night. Plus 230, 250. Hopefully by the time it goes off plus 300, um, I, I'm taking it. Yeah, I'm actually also going to wait to bet it. I put a little bet on, on Corey, but like kind of see if the line just inflates, inflates, inflates and get the best plus money. But Mr. Plus, Corey predicted on social media for a late finish for himself. Maybe he's the one that drags Umar into deep waters. Slick. Odds makers obviously set the line here for a reason. Do you think it's Umar by chain wrestling, and uh, or, or do you think Corey can do it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I could really see like Umar wrestling him in the first and first two rounds, but this is, I think, like you said, this is going to be probably a damage based type of fight. Like, is Umar because he's just one of those guys that he doesn't really hunt for subs. He waits for you to make a mistake, and then that's when he takes the opportunity. I think Corey, he's already seasoned on the floor. I think he won't make a mistake. <clears throat> that puts him in a bad predicament. And at the end of the day, man, like you said, this is just basically a levels check in my eyes. I, I'm going to go with Umar as a pick, but all the value is on Corey Sanhagen. Like, best believe if Corey Sanhagen gets to plus 300 around there by fight night, well, more than likely would because at the end of the day, you know, UFC bets are get higher as the fights go on, you know, because some people, they just want to bet on the next fight. 
So if he gets to plus 300, I'm definitely taking a snag on Corey Sanhagen. All the value is on him, I believe. But at the end of the day, people people just can't deny what Umar has been showing in his fights. A lot of good striking, a lot of good kicks. He's just not one of those types of guys that – I mean, he is one of those types of guys that could hold you for three rounds. But he does have some flashy striking. But now he's going to go up in a guy like that has probably the flashiest striking in the division. So oh, let's see what he could do against him. At the end of the day, he hasn't been – he's only been through adversity one time for like two seconds, and that was against Asma Beckham last fight when he got knocked down. But other than that, he was able to get a takedown, and then next thing you know, the whole round he was on the on the on top. So let's see how he does against Corey Sanhagen. But pick is pick is Umar bet is going to be probably Sanhagen. Isn't that funny, right? Slicks like I'll predict Umar, but I'm going to bet Sanhagen, right? And that's how betting math goes, right? You can pick one side and say, hey, at these odds, the implied probability, you know, to say Corey wins X percent of the time, you're giving me these odds. Come on now, I'm going to try it out. Maybe I'm a sucker. Maybe I'm getting trapped. Take my money. I'll, if he loses, call it a donation to the Corey Sanhagen pay-per-view fund. Well, it's not a pay-per-view. It's a fight night. Well, I hope he gets my money. Uh, all right. Let's move on, fellas. It's time for the dogs of the week. Let them out. Let him out. And, man, we're going to start with Mr. Plus because his dog of the week is an absolute doge. And I'm excited for him to talk about it. Who you got, bro? Yeah, if you want to talk about a real dog. <laughs> Uh, Marlon Chito Vera is my dog of the week, man. I know he's fighting Davis, Davison Figueredo. Uh, me and Slick were trying to do a little trivia the other day. Who's his only other loss besides uh, Brandon Moreno? It's like hard to even think of it. It's for Miga, like 20 years ago, whatever. Uh, you know, you wouldn't even expect it. But I think his next loss is going to be this Saturday against Marlon Cheeto Vera. This dude is unpredictable. He's bigger. He's longer. Uh, I, I just think he's going to be able to keep this thing on the feet. And if he does, that's where Davis and Figueredo is going to be in trouble. Not that he doesn't have hands. Just Marlon is that guy. He's that dude. Uh, his kickboxing, he can put it on you. He loves those dirty clinch, the dirty boxing. He'll elbow you out of nowhere. I just think he's too unpredictable, too big, and probably going to be too strong. Um, um, you know, obviously, if you guys don't know, Figueredo moved up uh, in, in weight. So now he's got to fight guys like Marlon. So Cheeto Vera for the dub plus money. The line's closing. It's plus 132 right now. Uh, I mean, I feel like this might be a pick by the time it goes off. Just based on how popular Cheeto is. Everyone loves Cheeto. Everyone loves Cheeto. He just fought O'Malley for the belt. Got the title shot. Jumped the line. And yeah, he got beat up bad. But it's Sugar Sean O'Malley. He's a pretty sharp dude. He took a knee from hell from O'Malley kept coming forward. We know Cheeto's got the chin of steel slick. And it is interesting because um, now at bantamweight, like Mr. Plus said, Figueredo's look, there's my dog going off. Shut up, Hercules. I'm doing a podcast. Uh, Perfect timing for the dogs of the week. Actually, let, keep barking, bro. Good vibes. Exactly. <laughs> but we know, uh, yeah, he looks pretty good at bantamweight. I actually bet on Cody Garbrandt slick in the last fight at UFC 300. And I know I was way going out on a limb and taking a shot. Hey, man. Cody Garbrandt won that first round, and he and he, he got subbed in the second, but he got vertigo in the middle of the fight. His head was spinning. I'm not going to say he was going to beat him, but he looked damn good. And I'm feeling like Mr. Plus's points about Figgy at bantamweight, maybe he gets cracked. Maybe the power touches him of Chito Vera, who's been trying to march people down but just hasn't quite had success at the top, top, top level, right? Is this a winnable matchup for him in your eyes, Slick? Yeah, I mean, actually, we was talking about Cheeto Vera earlier in the week when, on my IG Live with Brasco and stuff like that. And I honestly love him in this spot, man. Like like I was talking about Menafield. Menafield, I mean, uh, Figueredo, a lot of his fights against Fra Rob Font. Rob Font was outlanding him a lot in that fight. But Davidson Figueredo would land a knockdown in the round, knockdown in the second round, and that would secure him the round. And honestly, I don't even remember the last time Marlon Vero has ever been dropped. I honestly think he has never been dropped in the UFC. So I I, I just give a lot of edges to 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 Marlon Vero. Like durability edge is definitely on the Marlon Vero side. Chin, Marlon Vero side, pure jujitsu, Marlon Vero side. Dirty, dirty, dirty. Uh, when it gets down and dirty, who can you trust? Marlon Vera. Like the only thing I give Figueredo probably is is probably wrestling, maybe because he has been working on his wrestling lately. Somebody sent me a picture of him looking at Khabib training on the mat. Like, bro, that means absolutely nothing. He's looking at Khabib. Like, wow. Like, how many of uh, other UFC fighters have done that? And they, oh my God, he, like, <laughs> it was just weird. Like, why would you send me that? Like, he he's training out of a great gym in the Henry Cejudo gym. You know. So at the end of the day, he he's he's training with a great wrestler himself. But 
like I said, I just think this is going to be a lot more. Uh, Vera is going to be having the more moments, having the more, I would say, let's say if Vera Figueredo gets us down to the ground, I can see Marlon Vera reversing, getting them grounding pounds, getting them elbows. I just think a lot of signs point uh, point to me to bet the Marlon Vera side. So I'm on Marlon Vera. Yeah, I saw that picture too. And maybe he's getting in some work with Khabib. He said, like said he's looking at Khabib. That's funny, bro. <laughs> and yeah, we know he's with Fight Ready now. Whenever he's with that camp, Figgy's his best version usually. But I, I want to see Vera make it a dirty fight. If it gets dirty, if it gets nasty, I'm gonna want I'm gonna bet Chito Vera. I, I'm gonna back him just because I feel like fighting these sharp strikers like O'Malley, I, this is the most winnable matchup, in my opinion, for him. If he can just try to march Figgy, take away the space and make it nasty. And uh, I think he has success doing that, maybe. So I expect it to be a close fight. I actually see it going decision. And I'm going to say uh, it maybe even ends in like a 29-28 split. You look at Vera's last three losses, Jose Aldo, Corey Sanhagen, Sean O'Malley for the title. I can forgive you for all those. Let's go. I'm with you, Mr. Plus. We're going Chito Vera. I'm riding. Let's go. All right. That's his dog of the week. Uh, Slick, you have a dog of the week with a massive plus money price tag. Who are you betting, bro? Yeah, man. Honestly, this, I'm betting Tony Ferguson, man. I, I, I have to in this spot, bro. Now Michael Chiesa is closing in as minus 750, like on DraftKings, plus 500 for Tony Ferguson. This is honestly his most winnable fight that he had in the last eight, seven losses that he had. Like, And all of those losses, you always gave some type of power edge to hurt Ferguson. Like the guy was in an arm bar and Charles Oliveira didn't tap. A heel hook from Benil Darius and didn't tap. Like, what, what can Chiesa do here other than dry hump his UFC cup over Tony Ferguson's face for three rounds? Like, what, like, honestly, like, he, Kevin Holland hit him with one punch and he showed up and said, I quit. And he said, I quit. I don't, I don't want nothing to do with this. At the end of the day, man, Chiesa puts himself in positions to get submitted. Tony Ferguson, for at the end of the day, you could say, he has moments in those fights. In every single loss that he had, he had moments. Against Bobby Green, he dropped Bobby Green. Against Chandler, he dropped Chandler. And against Patty, he had a third round of hell until he tripped and fell. Like, I, I, I just don't know what people are. I understand Tony Ferguson is a, he's been washed. But, bro, Michael Chiesa as minus 750, like, I, I, I don't know how. Like, he's not the most dangerous fighter. The only thing I can see him here, here is, like, legit crotch sniffing for three rounds. And if that happens, fuck it. Fuck it. At minus 500, Tony Ferguson has all the upside in the world in this fight. The submission upside. The most damaging punch upside. Like, at, like he keeps this round on the, on the feet for two, two minutes. He could have a moment. He could hurt Chiesa with something. Like, I could pluck right now and I hurt Chiesa. Chiesa, Chiesa is so inactive. He fights one time a year. He fights one time a year. At, at least you got to give Tony props. He's been the most active fighter. Man, it's minus. I'm just baffled at this line, man. Minus 750. Preach. Like, minus 750, bro, is just crazy, bro. Like, I understand people just fading Tony Ferguson. But if you got Michael Chiesa in your parlays at minus 750, Something like something is legitimately wrong. Like you watch any of his fights, the last couple fights, he's been trash. Like he's been so reluctant. Like you just got to think about the opportunities that he had. Like he had a he had Vicente Luque in a rear naked choke position, almost choked him out. And the next thing you know, ten seconds later, he ends up getting choked out. Like the the guy is just I, I just don't know what people seeing, man. I don't care what I what I had against Tony Ferguson. I honestly faded him. His last seven fights, like I legit faded every single one of, I mean, I legit bet on every single one of everybody's fights. But Michael Chiesa, man, we got to do better than this. If he dry humps Tony Ferguson for three rounds, I'm cool with losing. Probably, I probably put a unit on him, man. It's crazy. Yo, what a breakdown on the Tony Ferguson Michael Chiesa fight. Do you, do you guys think that Slick is a Chiesa fan? Do you think he's Chiesa's biggest fan? He ripped him apart, and I totally agree. Minus 750 is outrageous for a pure grappler who's gotten submitted by other non-pure grapplers, right? By the way, Chiesa loves to get Darce choked. We're here on the Darce Parlay, uh, Darce Parlay, Darce Podcast. 
Um, let's have a look-see. Like Slick alluded to, Kevin Holland touched him, Darce choked him. Vicente Luque got out of a rear naked, reversed it, Darce choked him. Jorge Masvidal, early in his career, Darce choked him. Chiesa is susceptible to the namesake of the podcast, and Tony's got a Darce. He's got a couple Darce wins on the resume, so that would be awesome. But holy shit, Mr. Plus, the last seven fights, we've been watching the ghost of El Kokoy. It's been rough ever since <laughs> Justin Gaethje battered his head in. He was never the same. But like Slick said, he's had moments in all the fights. Touched Chandler with a good shot, dropped him, and then got front kicked in the face into the shadow realm and was the, the, the Squidward meme. I mean, poor guy. We're rooting for him. And I saw someone in one comment say, Tony plus 440 for all the money he lost his fans the seven fights before. <laughs> Do you think he can get it all back or is Chiesa the obvious side? Um, I had no pick, no bet on this fight before this conversation. I, I thought I was just going to roll with the huge minus as a pick for the show. But after that slick breakdown on his dog of the week, um, yeah, I, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and bet on Tony and I'm going to pick Tony. Uh, and and I, I, I like that what you just said, get everybody their money back uh, that ever put anything on him in these last however many fights. But yeah, he has had moments. Tony is still Tony and maybe he's still dangerous. And yeah, Michael Chiesa is just not. Yeah, he doesn't do anything. He just he he looks like uh, like Manel cop without even, you know, with the broken toe. He's just bouncing around and then once in a while clinch up and, you know, uh, that's about it. I, I, I got to I got to roll with slick on this one. Uh, fuck it. I'll, I, if I take the L, I'll take the L gracefully. No problem. That's exactly how I feel. Like, I'm probably going to put half a unit on Tony. And similarly, if it loses, like, donate it to the Tony Ferguson Make-A-Wish Foundation. Like, whatever, make a wish on plus 440 because it's a long shot, but the odds just make you want to bet it. And he's got a great fan base in MMA. There was one day when we thought we'd see him matched up with Khabib, the fight that never was. All of a sudden, we're sitting here on a seven-fight losing streak, still giving him fights at 40 years old, begging for him not to take any more damage because we got love for Tony, right? Uh Bro, remember, remember Dana White been saying that he wanted Tony Ferguson to retire. Imagine he beats Chiesa and they have to give him another fight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Who do they give him next? If he beats Chiesa, it's like, oh, God, matchmakers are like, what do we do? It's like a, a complex math problem. Yeah, good luck solving that one. All right, guys. Uh, I got my dog of the week. I gave it to you in my Br Brasco breakdown. It's got to be Corey Sanhagen. I mean, how am I not? Just go really there? quickly, guys, to give you a little caveat. Sorry to interrupt. I don't mean to be that guy, but I have to every once in a while. Tony Ferguson by submission. Um, bet online right now is is now opened at plus one uh, plus eight hundred. Oh yeah, so and, that's what yeah, they're looking at the by method. submission. That's the method. And slick, I know you can even go to like bet MGM, something you've done before. You can bet exact method of submission. You, Tony by Darce is the play. No, I mean it's got to be plus a million. We'll look at that. I remember yeah, slick. Up up there. Oh, if somebody up. bets Tony by Darce and hits it and presents the ticket and, and has a big winning, um, they need to like do it in a reel or do it in a story, tag the Darce podcast, and we got to figure out what we can get that person or what the heck we can do as far as a, a prize for that, because I think that would be dope. That's absolutely electric. If, if someone pulls off a Darce story, especially Tony Ferguson, yeah, we're going to need to do some sort of giveaway. So just as a, as, a, as a standard operating procedure, guys, everyone watching this, smash the like, drop a comment, and you'll be eligible whatever giveaway we cook up if that Darce gets pulled off uh, on this uh, on this weekend's UFC Abu Dhabi card. So just give us some love in the chat in the in the uh, on the algorithm, and we'll try to give you some love back. If we get a Darce joke. Like I said, dog of the week, Corey Sanhagen for me. I uh, broke it down. Why? Honestly, you can make mine Loopy as well. I love Slick's breakdown on Loopy. I think we all really like Loopy a lot. So yeah, there's a dogs all across the board that are interesting here. But now it's time. For the Darce parlay, fellas, talk about Darce got me ready to put up a parlay. I'm going to start it off, y'all. I'm going to the main uh, main card, top of the card here. I'm going with Shara Bullet. Shara Magomedov, I think he gets it done, no problem. I take it on Mikhail Olejechuk, dangerous striker, explosive guy. Can try to touch you up with that southpaw boxing, rip shots to the head and body. But he's a wild man, and he leaves himself way too exposed to counter strikes. And he's taking losses by finish, right? Oftentimes when he loses, and he's losing a lot lately, he's getting put away inside the distance. He's dangerous, but finally they're giving Shara a striker. He's been facing grapplers, right? I think he's way more technical, way more precise. 
And Olajicek's going to leave himself open and probably get dropped. I like Shara by knockout in this one. It's in Abu Dhabi. We're building up Shara bullet. Shara the pirate, right? Give him a highlight knockout win. Give me Shara for my leg. Mr. Plus, you got a great fight to talk about that we haven't discussed yet. Who's your leg? Are we talking about your leg? Are we all? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Re yeah. React, react to mine and then jump into yours. I'm scared of yours. I'm not going to lie. Ola Jacek is a striker, and this is, uh, and so is Shara. And this is going to be Shara's best striker that he's ever went up against. And when that dog in Ola Jacek moves forward, he hasn't looked that good in his last couple fights. He got submitted in both of them. Um, but but they were submissions. This isn't a sub guy. This is going to be a guy who wants to stand up, kickbox. Shara's best weapon is his leg kicks. Um, so I do believe he could set him back with that and throw him off. But, you know, if Ola Jacek keeps moving forward and hands to the face, uh, we've never seen Shara get hit in the face like I've seen Ola Jacek hit Cheedy. So I do I do believe in Ola Jacek as a dog this week. Um, however, yeah, I mean, you got to feel like the UFC is trying to move this Shara kid up the charts quick. Uh, but but yeah, I'm scared of that, man. I'm, I, I'm not going to lie. That's where I'm at with that one. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And it is true. I mean, he's a dangerous guy. He beat Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, so that's a really good win. But other than that, man, I mean, his wins are Cody Brundage and Sam Alvey, you know, Shamil who Gamzatov, yeah, Modestus Bukowskis. He's got some UFC wins. I got to get Gad Zimarov, Antigulov. Like, he's still around for a reason. But yeah, he's gotten knocked out bad by, uh, you know, Michelle Pereira, Kevin Holland. Those are some pretty damn good fighters. But I feel you for your fear. I mean, he's a dangerous guy. I think Shara wins in Abu Dhabi. Who is your leg, my friend? You got a good fight. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Slick, what do you what do you what do you want to say about that? I saw you. Oh, I keep that keep up and pass. My bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Shara is gonna be in Abu Dhabi because the man doesn't can't fight in the USA because of his eye. So <laughs> you're just going to see this guy whenever they have something in Saudi Arabia or Abu Dhabi, he's going to be there. And, uh, I mean, it's a good spot for him. Like, I like the Mikel, uh, Mikel's pressure. But that's one thing that's going to, I think, lead to his demise in this fight. The pressure is just going to wait. Shower is just going to wait for one counter punch, two counter punches or something. And I, I just, honestly, there was a little setback in me with the shower because I was just so disappointed in the way he really let Trocali last to that third round. Trocali, I was, I watched that fight. The second round, he was deaf gassed, hands down to his waist, not blocking no type of punches, just rolling backwards. So that was a little bit disappointing. But if Shower, out, Shower comes out here aggressive with his striking power, with his kicks, I think he could definitely land something on Mikel. But if this might be the last leg, if I got, like, a lot of money on Shower and he be, ends up being the last leg of a couple parlays or something, I might look a little hedge for Mikel by, by KO because I don't think Mikel could win a, uh, win a decision. I think Shower is definitely going to have a little bit more volume now if it does get to the decision. And at least he'll squeeze it out just because of Abu Dhabi. So I think Shower is the side, but best believe if, if it gets down to it, I will find a hedge on um, Mikel by KO or something. And I think that would be our last leg as well to cash it. So maybe the maybe the hedge will be live as well. Um, but let me jump into mine. I know you want to hear who I got, Brasco. I, I this guy is a favorite this week, and his line keeps moving in his direction. But he has that dog in him, and his only recent loss was to Armin Surukian. Right, so I'm taking Joel Alvarez to beat up Elves Brenner. Now, don't get me wrong; we've seen Brenner with the blonde hair go bloody, and he won that fight when he was actually down, and he came back in the third round, had grit and heart. Uh, but I just like Joel Alvarez. He's a, he's a bigger dude, lankier dude. He's really strong uh, for a big, tall guy, and in in this division, I really like everything he could do on the ground. He's won his last fight by Dars. Shout out to Joel Alvarez. Um, but I've bet on this guy many times before, even against Armin Sarukian. Um, but for me, betting on him, I think I'm three and one. I'm going with him again. He's a guy that's got me money. And you've seen his line move. I think he opened up at minus 120. He's all the way up to minus 190 now, Slick was telling us. So, yeah, man, I have to go ahead and take Joel Alvarez. Joel El Fenomeno Alvarez, Slick Grappler, Nasty Elbows. Got some really good wins. Like you said, they kind of rushed him up fast, gave him arm on. Maybe that was a little too much too soon. But he's a good fighter, man. Elvis Brenner, like you said, has that dog in him. Had that awesome comeback win against Guram Kukataladze, a fighter that's also on this card. We'll talk about that later. But, yeah, minus 155 when we were chatting about it yesterday, putting together the parlay as we started to get the podcast ready. Boom, lines up to minus 190, and it opened 120. So it sounds like you're on the sharp side of it. Slick, how do you see this fight? I'm wondering if it gets nasty, will Alvarez be comfortable and be able to hang, uh, hang with Brenner, who likes a nasty fight? 
I honestly think Joel Alvarez is going to bring the nasty in this fight. Like, I think Joel Alvarez has shown in in all of his wins that he will, if he gets you the slightest of hurt, he's finishing you. Like, all 20 of his wins come by finish. Like, all, like most of them come in by submission. So, at the end of the day, there's always that dilemma. Like, everybody be like, oh, my God, you don't want to bet against the Shoot the Lima uh, guys. You know, they're great grapplers. But Joel Alvarez will probably submit Brenner in this spot if he hurts him or gets him down to the ground. I just think Joel Alvarez, if – there's been so many times that we've seen Brenner hurt and nobody take advantage of it. If Joel Alvarez gets him hurt, he's getting him out of there. I, I really believe that. Like, I truly, truly believe that. And he was one of the people that I was looking to bet early at minus 130. Like I said, I, did, I wasn't able to watch tape on this just yet. So I didn't want to bet him just on the blind. But I was so mad. By the next day, it was minus 155, minus 170. And the next thing you know, this morning, we were just talking about it. He's minus 190 on some books. So... I missed the boat on that one, but best believe I love Joel Alvarez and parlays this week. I just think he gets Brenner out of there, gets him hurt early, and gets him out of there. Yeah, maybe missed the boat on a straight bet uh, with the line getting juiced up now, but didn't miss the boat to add it to the Dars parlay, which Mr. Plus is bringing for us here. And, man, 20 uh, – looking at the records, man, 20 wins, 20 by stoppage for Alvarez, 20 professional fights for Brenner, never been finished. Something's got to give, right? I'm really interested to see how this one plays out. We're going Joel Alvarez, second leg of the Darce. And Slick, cap it off for us. You got a couple big boys throwing down in the desert. Yeah, usually I try to stay away from these heavyweights, man. You know how I feel about them. I usually just take the overs in these spots because at the end of the day, none of these guys finished either of them. But I think this is just a good spot for Shamil, man. Bounce back win against a guy like Dante Mays that, honestly, I just don't see nothing good of him. Like, the only highlight of his career is him dry humping a guy's face for three seconds. So, at the end of the day, man, we Shamil, he, he's going to bring the pressure. Dante Mays doesn't do good with pressure. And like, and I just don't think Mace is good, man. He oh, he's all hype. All the words is, oh my God, he's training with John Jones. You know who else trained with John Jones? Wall Harris, and he's not in the UFC no more. So, at the end of the day, I like Shamil. I think he brings the pressure, and he he got gassed against Rosenstrike because he wasn't able to get the takedowns. I think he could get the takedowns in this spot. I think he could just keep it on the feet and just do what he did to Budai, just implement great pressure, great great uh, cl uh clinch control, and just wear on Maze. Maze has been shown to get tired. I understand Ghazi have looked tired last fight, but like I just said, he failed takedowns. He failed to get the clinch going, and it was just basically Rosenstrike picking him apart picking them apart from the outside. So I think it's a good spot for him in this fight, a bounce back spot, honestly. And Shamil, I think he has the good things destined for him. I think he just has to work work on his all-around game. And if at the end of the day, I think any type of game that he brings into this fight is good against Dante Mays. I totally agree, man. Look, he looked bad, bad against Jarzinho, but it was way too much too soon. Another case of that, right? In the first round, he charged at him to get a takedown, ran his forehead against the fence, and you were like, Oh, my God. That was, like, one of the ugliest attempts you'll ever see. And, like you said, he labored. He tried to, you know, Jarzino, sharp counter-striking kickboxer, good footwork. He said, let me grapple with you. Let me take that away. And he failed to do it, and he gassed himself out doing it. But I don't think we should just jump off the Shamil train, call him a fraud just yet. He's dangerous, and Mays is a, is a beatable opponent, right? Mays is a guy that you can grind on, clinch up with. He's getting into competitive fights with much lower-level guys. So if Shamil puts that, you know, that pressure on him and lands some boxing combos, gets him the clinch, grapples a little bit. I think he has a lot of success. And cashes this Dars parlay for us at plus 203 odds, fellas. Like the guys mentioned, Shara Magomedov will be the last leg. So if it's down to him, go ahead and throw a little hedgy action and make your money no matter what. That's always a smart way to play it. All right, guys, it's time for the honorable mentions. We got to talk about the fights that we haven't talked about yet. And there's some interesting ones on the prelims. First one I want to go out is uh, Jai Herbert, minus 165 against Rolando Bedoya, plus 140. Interesting fight. I don't have a great read on it, Mr. Plus. You know, Herbert's had some interesting fights in the UFC. Bedoya looked good against Chaos Williams in his debut. Actually got robbed. I thought he won that fight. And then he comes out and lays a dud, complete egg against Song Kanan. So I don't know how to rate him. He's actually with the Diego Lima shoot the box guys too now. So I wonder how he comes back. What do you think of Bedoya as a dog, Mr. Plus? Definitely not betting this one. As you guys can see, it's in our honorable mention, so we'll just talk about it. I don't hate Bedoya as a dog, but Jai Herbert, he is slick on the feet, and that's where he wins. He's, he outpoints you. He beats you by decision. Uh, I, I'm just not a huge fan of his. 
and and I don't like this fight at all. I'll probably I might I might look at the over uh, for this fight. I don't know if anyone's getting finished in this one. Um, but yeah, if I had to lean anything, it would probably just be Jai Herbert because I've seen him before and he he does look pretty good on the feet sometimes. But other than that, uh, yeah, he, he's not one of my favorite fighters or anything. I'm gonna skip this one, boys. I like your lean towards the over just off first first thought, right? Like Herbert's not – Herbert has finished people, but Bedoya is a tough kid. We saw him take shots from Chaos Williams and just smile at them. And um, I, I could see this being a weirdly competitive 29-28-esque fight. So I'm with you on the over. Slick, are you picking a side here? Yeah, I want to see how Bedoya looks on weigh-ins in this fight. He's moving down a weight class to 155 for this fight. And I, I always thought he was a little bit – chubbier of the of the part and at 170 so i want to see how he looks at 155 now hopefully he look if he looks a little bit shredded look like he took it serious i might take him in this spot i think he could definitely outpoint uh jai herbert i mean not outpoint get it make it dirty and if jai herbert just sticks to the outside like he has been his last two fights i think he could probably uh, cut the cage off and get the takedown so i like i like bedoya but i want to see how how he how he took this weight cut very interesting. Moving weight classes, going down. Always want to see how it looks on their body. So I guess I'll lean towards Bedoya because yeah, Herbert's hard to trust sometimes. But uh, I don't like it. I probably will pass on this fight and take maybe the over two and a half minus one eighty as a parlay piece, Mister Plus. I like that look. All right, Guram Kukataladze minus one ninety against Jordan Vucenic. Vucenic. Hope I pronounced that right. Plus. 170 range this guy's coming in from cage warriors pretty slick grappler hard-nosed guy. He's not uh, you know is not afraid of getting into a gritty fight and guram last we saw him oh man i mean he got completely just gassed and folded up against elvis brenner after he was pouring on the damage looking really good all of a sudden guram hasn't won in years man i mean the last win we remember of his that kind of catapulted him was I guess a robbery split decision against Mateus Gamera. I had Guram as a big plus money dog. And when they yet when they raised his hand at the end, I was like, holy shit, they gave it to me. Because Mateus probably won that. But uh looking at him now, you know, what's the trajectory for Guram? He's uh, uh Hamzat's best bud, so they're you know have close relationship and train a lot together. He's a guy that brings a lot of pace, is sort of a high volume kickboxer with grappling and scrambling ability. But, yeah, I mean, looking at the last few losses, I mean, Demir Ismagulov split decision loss. Brenner knocked him out. And then he even lost to an arm lock in a grappling tournament recently. I'm not going to make too much of that. But, Slick, do you think this is a good spot for Guram to get back in Abu Dhabi and try to, you know, regain this career trajectory a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think it's Guram enough and in this spot. You got Jordan coming up a weight class on short notice. like, And he's just one of those guys that he usually has – He loses, uh, he usually looks for the uh, grappling to really be his success. Like his last four fights have all been by submission in his way. So I just think that Guram isn't probably going to – just going to keep it on the feet. Like like that's one thing that we can say about Guram. Has great takedown defense. Trains with the likes like Hamza all day in the grappling. So I think he keeps this fight on the feet and just probably pe uh, outpoints Jordan. Jordan sometimes does pull, uh, does have a great gas tank, but like I said, he's he's using his grappling, he's using his wrestling a lot. Like he he has he did he does have a, a good win against Paul Hughes and a a good win against Morgan Chariot. But like I said, those guys are on the smaller boat. Uh, uh, Guram is way taller, way lengthier, and definitely like I said, he's coming up a weight class on short notice in Abu Dhabi. It's just a lot of things going against them in this spot. I think it's Guram or nothing. I agree with you. I didn't like run to make him a parlay piece, but I agree with you. Mr. Plus, how do you see this fight for Guram? Same side. Uh, you know, if if you get a year off, you know, after your last loss, because he got knocked out bad in the and at the end of that third round, but he some would say he was winning the fight till all that happened. I mean, he clearly was, right? Um, I'm not crazy. <laughs> I, I think Guram all day uh takes this W. Uh don't get me wrong though, the Cage Warriors are now getting a name for themselves. It's kind of looking like if you came from Cage Warriors, it's better than being in Bellator or PFL, man. It's Cage Warriors dudes are really moving up. Uh, you know, Patty and Tommy and all these heads from England, uh Cage Warriors looking pretty solid. Um, however, uh yeah, coming up a weight class short notice just like Slick just said, I think Guram's been training for a fight for a minute now, uh, and you had to have been working on your gas tank from that last loss. Like, you have to be working on that for the last year. So, uh, give me Guram. Um, I kind of see it as a parlay piece. I like it, man. And, yeah, he went the distance in a high-paced fight with Mateus Gamrot, chain wrestler, takedown, takedown. So, it was wild to see him just kind of collapse against Brenner. Hey, man, it happens. Brenner's 
Brown's a tough bastard. And, and where where did Demir Ismagulov go? Where is this guy? I loved him. He was great. Won yeah, lots did, of money off of him. Did he, didn't he, he lose to like Grant Dawson? Yeah, he. I, I heard something that he retired for like mental health. Damn. Hey, man. I saw Umar. Umar even say, wow. like, "Yeah, Umar." This week he was like, "I'm going to retire at 33." And a lot of people were in the comments like, "What? What the hell?" I'm like, "Dude, it's the fight game, man. Like, you can only get punched in the brain for so long." Leave with your mind. Leave with your ability to enjoy your life and, like, think cognitively. Like, I respect it. So, yeah, um, I would probably retire after my first MMA fight. Yeah, yeah, I got to touch on that. I like uh, – you listen, I love Tom Aspinall. He's a bad motherfucker. And, listen, he's moving up the ranks, and I'm sure he's making a lot of money per fight. But when you say something in an interview like uh, everybody who's making businesses and all that other shit is stupid, like, no, no, they're preparing for after the fight game, bro. Because if you go to war with John Jones and get hit in your head or choked out, you might feel a different way. Um, so I don't know. We got to wait and see. But that was to me like that. How are you gonna make a comment like uh, all I want to do is fight? That's what I want to do. I, I get it. You're locked in. You're zoned in. You're a young guy. You're probably talking out of your ass right now. It's all good. It's all good. You're high off the fight, dude. What do you? All these other guys, Dustin Poirier, smart. These guys are smart making other businesses. Like it's not all the fight game. Thirty three is a good age to retire. Shit. <laughs> no, for sure. And you're right. He was like, um, you know, do you want to do all this, this and that? I think he was more referring to like he was like the yachts and the private jets. He was kind of throwing shots at the McGregor S behavior, but you're right. Like you got to build a brand. You got to have assets outside just your fists, right? You got to make money after you, you leave the cage and your brand keeps creating that revenue. And that's what these guys are doing, right? They make more than that on that than they do on their fight contracts. So that's the game right there. By the way, Mr. Plus cage warriors, you mentioned Patty Aspinall, Ian Gary. I mean, cage warriors are in the mix right now. So very true. Um, we talked Shamil Gazeev versus Dantel Mays. That's Need to be on the honorable mentions. Last one, guys. Mohamed Yaya, plus 285, taking on Kawi Kawe Fernandez, Caillou, Caillou Fernandez, minus 360. Slick is not a fan of Mohamed Yaya. I will let him tell you why. Yeah, honestly, I just don't think he's UFC material. Like, I'm going to keep this real short and simple. I think I'm a better fighter than Mohamed Yaya. <laughs> I think I could get into that UFC octagon with him. And if he holds me for three rounds and not throw any punches, I will land the more damaging punches in those three rounds. The guy sucks. Everybody says that he has a wrestling base. Trevor Peak, I could throw a little piece of metal right here from my floor and, and Trevor Peak will fall. Like, that's how bad his takedown defense is. He couldn't do shit. Held him against the cage for three rounds. Trevor Peak was piecing him up, getting the wrestling going himself. I just don't trust Yaya. I'm betting Caillou Fernandez by by uh by KO or so. And er, all the Abu Dhabi residents that are on there are like, wow, man, our man Mohammed Yaya just got knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> He's fading a hometown guy. Obviously, the books are seemingly fading him too, making him plus 285. Mr. Plus, he's one of those guys that fights like he spars. It's just not that dangerous. I, I think Fernandez is definitely the side. What do you think? Yeah, uh, Fernandez, of course, uh, could be a parlay piece here. Um, what do these guys each have one fight, though, in the UFC or something like that? They, they, you know, you got to go back and watch some other tapes. So you got to trust Slick on this one and fade fade the Yaya. Uh, he said Trevor Peak could get hit with a piece of Tululum and fall over. <laughs> the, Tululin, the Tululin element, it's one of the rarest elements. Um, <laughs> yeah, man, uh, Muhammad Yaya is not it, I don't think. Although, yeah, his last – or excuse me uh, – his uh, opponent, or Caillou, Caillou Fernandez, is coming off a split decision loss to Mark Jacasey, Mark Jacabib, I should say. So that's decent experience there. He probably bounces back with a win here. Big, uh, big favorite, maybe parlay piece. All right, fellas, we did the damn thing. If you haven't yet, hit the like button, drop a comment, let us know what you're liking this week. The Dars parlay is plus 203. I gave you Shara Magomedov. Mr. Plus gave you Joel Alvarez. Slick gave you Shamil Gazeev. We got the Mr. Plus Parlay Bus plus 235 action with Cedricus Dumas, Victoria Dudakova, and Azamat Mirzakhanov. Slick broke down on his report. Lupi Godinez as a dog. I'm giving you Corey Sanhagen for my breakdown and a whole lot more. So go back, fast forward, rewind, go through all the takes, and get some good information before you bet. UFC Fight Night Abu Dhabi. On behalf of myself, Mr. Plus Money, Slick Montana. And Cal on the ones and twos, thank you guys all for watching. Good luck on the bets, and let's cash. We'll see you next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. Brass goals break down. Yeah.